The first title of the first speaker is Memory and Attention Plus Cognitive Neuroscience at Cornell. Nathan, take it away. So I want to talk about two things um, in these next 15 minutes. Uh, really, the science that's being conducted here on this campus, in this building, just down the hall, um, we have a brand new MRI scanner where we can do really amazing, innovative scans of the human brain to better understand um, the complex mechanical processes underlying cognition, your ability to think, your ability to pay attention to what's happening here in front of you, and to remember events from your life and imagine things that might happen in your future. So what, I'm, what I hope to tell you about is the first study that's been conducted on the scanner and also um, some of those results and hopefully walk you through them to the best I can so that you can maybe learn a little bit more about the brain today. So memory and attention are these, these big concepts um, and they interact all the time. So when you remember something, you can retrieve information um, from your mind, from your past, uh, that might be relevant to the ongoing moment. And the ability to uh, pay attention or to engage in an executive control of attention is to, to really focus um, you, you're in your mind's eye, like what's happening here in front of you um, and where you choose to focus. Perhaps, um, I know at least for some of my undergraduates, they might be texting underneath the, the counter. Somebody's on a computer right now with divided attention. Um, Attention can shift and, um, and change in any given moment, and it interacts all the time with our prior experiences. So some of you maybe have noticed that um, you're getting a little older, and memory isn't working quite as well. It's not quite as sharp as maybe it used to be. Um, you could be in a situation where you have this moment where you need to bring this idea to mind, so maybe somebody's name, and it's it's almost there, but it, it just doesn't quite arrive when you need it. And there's other times um, where it, it will come to mind and it's totally irrelevant. I don't know if you've ever found that you've, like you're on, you've been watching TV and you're on the couch and you stand up and you walk to the refrigerator and you open the door and you think, what am I doing here? <laughs> what, do, what did I come here to get? Um, and you've forgotten. Um, so in this way, we use memory a lot to help navigate the world. And a, a critical part of that is using our executive control of attention and memory interactively. And a really important thing to do is really understand how these things change across the lifespan. So what I'm going to share with you today is one of the first studies um, that I've conducted here at Cornell as an assistant professor um, and, um, and trying to address these, these sort of big questions. So I'm going to show you a task that I ran um, in the scanner with a number of undergraduates, about 40 undergraduates. And the objective here, this is what's called a working memory task. Um, it's called a two-back task. And what people are shown are a series of objects. And your job is to keep track of the objects and to say whether or not what you're looking at is the same as you saw two before in the sequence. Not just the last one, but two before. And in this case, um, this is a novel use of the, this NBAC task using faces. Now, you might notice that you recognize some of these faces. They might be a little familiar to you. But if you see a face that's the same as two before, just kind of raise your hand. Let's try another one. So in this study, we're really looking at two sort of critical components. One, where in the course of our working memory, where we're keeping track of this stream of information that's coming, there is a long-term memory probe that comes up here. And this is where it's, it's, it's the president. And this is an individual you're familiar with. You know things about them. You know his name. 
And this is where long-term memory can come in and help your working memory performance. It can help you in this task because you can name that person and hold it in mind. Now, there is another match here that I think most of you got as well. Um, but this is where, this is an anonymous person. You don't have any real information about them. You just have to hold their facial features in mind. But what's worse is your memory of Elvis can come in and actually disrupt your ability to hold that information online. And this would be a case where your long-term memory can actually hurt your ongoing performance because um, it can disrupt this bridge that you're making between these other two faces. And what this task, essentially, the objective of this task is to really examine how these long-term memory representations are interacting with your executive control of attention. Before I go into the, what we found, I want to just kind of give you a bit of an introduction to the field. So I teach in human development. I teach um, human brain and mind, primarily to sophomores, um, but really anyone interested in understanding cognitive neuroscience. We're learning about the relationship between the brain and behavior. And what my undergrads learned just this last September is that when you're processing visual information, there are parts of the brain that are very particularly attuned to the processing of faces. There's a region of the brain that's very that's engaged whenever it sees a human face. And it's called the fusiform face area. And there's another part of the brain that's very sensitive to seeing scenes. And what we did in the scanner for this first cognitive neuroscience study is we had um, another task where we just showed people scenes and faces. And what we found, and this is actual data from the scanner, what we found was beautifully we replicated this textbook case. So what we see is robust engagement of this area called the fusiform face area. And it's really right where it should be. This is great news because this is the first cognitive neuroscience study and the data are beautiful. It's replicating perfectly. This is one of the most established um, observations that we can find. Indeed, it's in the textbook. Just yesterday, I was introducing these undergraduates to what's called working memory and executive control um, of attention and highlighted a number of different regions of the brain that are critical for this. And this includes lateral prefrontal cortex and how it interacts with air posterior regions that are information specific, as well as parts of medial prefrontal cortex. So by lateral, I mean on the outside, and medial more along the midline. So when we look at these data for people just observing this flow of faces going by and holding them in mind, what we see which is quite lovely, is these exact same areas that you would expect um, straight out of the textbook. Uh, lateral prefrontal cortex, this area called dorsal anterior cingulate. In addition to that, we see this area, this fusiform gyrus lit up again, which is exactly what we'd anticipate. So what we have here is working memory for faces, which in a lot of ways, I find very beautiful, because this is exactly what we would expect to find when subjects are performing this task. It's straight out of the textbook. It's not going to get into science or nature. Um, but what we see is that what the prior work has done is really nicely showing that the scanner we have is producing beautiful data. Um, here we have an independent task where we just had people look at faces and scenes. And here we have them making, um, doing this working memory task on scenes and engagement of the fusiform face area. So this is beautiful. Everything is working perfectly. And this shows that we have a very bright future for this magnet in terms of the kind of results we can get from it. Um, and, that's, and that's really exciting, because this really is a proof of concept. We, we have good data. So here we have, generally, working memory for faces when people are observing the stream of faces. But what happens? when you see a famous face. We well, get a shift in the pattern of activity. When a famous face is seen, there's an increase in activation in processes of the brain that support memory. And it's significantly greater than when you're seeing an anonymous face, someone that you don't know, where you see higher activation in these executive control regions. Question? Can you, is there, I don't have a part of my brain that has a sense of direction, which apparently has to do with 
cross sections. Is there a difference between the left and the right view? So this is on the medial surface. So this is in the middle. And this is on the lateral surface. So this is on the outside. Sorry, so just in terms of localizing where this activity is. So the blue regions are more significantly active during perceiving a face you've never seen before. And these are tapping into these executive attention structures. Whereas when you see a face of someone you've know, you know something about, um, there's activation in an area called the hippocampus, which is critical for memory and other related memory structures. And essentially, what we have found is that there is this facilitation effect where long-term memory can actually support task performance as this information is brought online and makes things easier to actually perform. However, when having to process an anonymous phase, in particular holding that in mind when a long-term memory comes up, it takes more attention and is more demanding to actually successfully complete that kind of trial. And this is um, a really, I believe that this interaction is really critical in terms of trying to understand the aging brain in particular. Because we know that this region of the, these regions of the brain along the midline, the hippocampus, um, this posterior cingulate, medial prefrontal cortex, are selectively targeted, not just during normal aging, but also in the course of Alzheimer's disease. Now, this is a study that came out just last month. I wouldn't expect you to read it in the Journal of Neuroscience, but maybe you saw it in the Cornell Chronicle. Um, understanding what these systematic changes are over the course of the lifespan is going to be very critical in terms of pinpointing what is healthy aging and what is pathological aging. Because it's perfectly normal to not necessarily remember a new person's name um, or not to be able to retrieve that kind of information. And that may have more to do with the executive component of your attention. Whereas the inability to retrieve information that you've had for a long time, such as the names of your family members, if that kind of memory can't be brought to mind, that is more of an instance of pathological aging. And it's really trying to understand the relationship between these two systems and how they change will help us to better predict who might go on to have Alzheimer's disease and to know earlier we'll have a better chance of stopping it. But also, I believe, understanding the interactions between these systems will allow us to better understand and appreciate some of the positive consequences of aging as well, such as reduced anxiety, greater and longer view, as well as um, uh, potentially even this epiphenomenon just of wisdom. What is that? And how is it represented in the brain over the course of the lifespan? So these are the questions that I'm hoping to answer over the course of the next few years. This study that you just saw has just been submitted um, for, to the Cognitive Neuroscience Society to be presented and the first paper, hopefully, in the next few months. But what I'd really like to, to show to you is that four people were really critically involved in this project, and they're all Cornell undergraduates. They're actively involved in my lab and are just vital components to the, the success of my research endeavor. So thank you very much. Uh, tried this sort of investigation with other sensory modalities and visual, like hearing? Um, not at this point. Um, I, so have we used other modalities besides vision, such as hearing? Um, this is the first time, really the first study that I've begun running here at Cornell. Um, I believe we find converging findings. Human beings are very visually focused. Um, we rely a lot on vision. Much more cortex is dedicated to vision um, than it is to auditory processing. Um, but I would expect very similar kinds of effects. So if um, we heard the name of a famous person, um, we would probably still activate those long-term memory stores. And the prefrontal cortex that supports these executive components of attention um, that doesn't care so much about the modality, so whether it's visual or auditory. They would also engage in these same types of processing. Have you found a difference, or are you looking at the difference between men and women? Um, that's a very good question, looking at whether or not there are gender effects. Um, currently, we haven't. However, and doing so requires very large sample sizes. And over the course of the next few years, I will be having, 
building up a larger and larger sample in order to look at those kind of effects and whether or not there are, in fact, gender differences. At this point, it's, it's really it's too soon to say. Um, I don't know how if I don't study children as much. The same area of the brain? Yes, yes. So, the, okay, I'm sorry. Um, whether or not children um, sort of develop these same sort of processes, and if um, there's developmental problems, if we could exp what we could predict from them. Um, I'm only now actually starting to look at these networks in children and how they develop, um, and also what might occur in the event of some psychopathologies. But it's it's really at the moment, um, I'm examining data from a couple sites where we have 120 children from age 7 to 15, and we're just starting to track out the normal developmental trajectory of how these networks interact. Um, so it's, it's really too soon to know um, what, the, what that looks like in the case of some, like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or other um, other conditions, but it's a very good question, and there, there is, there are a lot of resources that are being thrown at trying to understand the brain along the system's view. Thank you. Can you determine the extent of damage to a brain in the event of a concussion? Can we determine the extent of damage to the brain due to a concussion? Um, yes and no. So there are some research scans that are able to detect um, very like very small lesions that can occur in the event of a concussion. What's unclear is how, in the long term, if what we can see now is going to be predictive of some of these issues that we see in terms of loss of concentration or um, you know, what we've observed at the NFL, potentially is association with suicide later on. Uh, we, we don't really know yet, but there, it's, it's certainly very important. Um, for the individuals that I scan, we tend to screen for concussion um, and other major psychiatric illnesses or head injuries to try to understand normal functioning first before um, certain pathologies. But it, there's a lot of research coming out of BU, Boston University, looking at that very question. You have one minute. Right, so what's the magnitude of this effect? Like how, how large is this impact on memory for, uh, for attention? Um, it's fairly significant. So what we found is that when people are matching, at least in the context of my task, when people are matching a famous face, um, they're, they're significantly faster at doing that than if they're matching anonymous faces. And they're also significantly more accurate at doing so. So th these are small sort of psychological constructs. Um, we're not really interested in how well we match famous faces. What we really want to understand is if you're walking out in the world and you're thinking to yourself and you see someone you know, do you recognize them? How well can you recognize them in the future? And how disruptive would it be to your ongoing thoughts if you see someone you know? If do you forget what you're thinking about? And that's what we're really trying to understand is how we maintain our focus and how we're able to take information we know from the environment and relate it to our memory. Um, and it's, it's hard to quantify sort of those real world aspects. And it is an endeavor that, that I'm, I'm aiming to understand better as, as we test more adults, and particularly across the lifespan, to see and understand these changes, as well as dissociate them from the more negative components of aging leading to Alzheimer's disease. Without further ado, Professor Andrew. Thank you, Val. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I'm really new. I arrived in July. Uh, I basically didn't know how to find this room. So um, I'm really, what I'm going to present to you today is things that I've been doing over a, a long period of time that I hope to be continuing here at Cornell. In particular, this talk was something that I gave to the Dalai Lama. Uh, on our work on the neural basis of the self, its plasticity following mindfulness meditation, 
and what we can learn from that about the human capacity for well-being and suffering. Um, so pretty big topics. So some of this is uh, very scientific, and a bit of it is a little bit like neurophilosophy. Um, but I'm going to go through the neurophilosophical part of it first, and then get to the uh, translational big impacts uh, for mental health at the end. Let's see how I... OK. So, um, it's healthy for you to think of yourself as one person. It turns out that our research in the brain suggests that uh, this sense of self as being unified is a bit of an illusion. There are really multiple selves in the brain. And this was predicted a really long time ago by the father of psychology, William James, and the principles of psychology in separating the me and the I. Uh, me is the self that we're most familiar with. Sure. Uh, Yes, that sounds a little bit better. Um, so William James distinguished between the me and the I. The me is the self that we're all familiar with, is our traits, who we are across time. If you think what it means to have a self, it means that you need to have memory. You need to not just exist in the moment, but you need an organism that can say that you experienced things in the past and you can see yourself in the future. And that continuity across time gives us a sense of self. There's another self that is in the moment, the I that acts now, um, that is existing here, and is not referring to the past, and is not referring to the present. And I'm going to go between, it's, it's a bad uh, habit of mine. We've, uh, I go between talking about this as me and I, and the narrative versus the experiential self. The narrative self is really the self, the me that narrates our experience, the me that the, we're most familiar with. The experiential self is that momentary self that's there all the time, but but that we might miss. Um, OK. Um, so this idea of the narrative self, or the me, uh, we and a number of other researchers have shown that <laughs> reflecting upon your traits, so if I were to, so in this task, present you with words like handsome, charming, smart, boring, and you were to make a self-assessment of how these really characterize you, in doing that, you activate a broad swath of structures in the cortical midline, many of the structures that Nathan was talking about. This is what we believe the neural basis for this continuous self, the me, the narrative self. When we ask people to try to focus on the moment, turns out there to visualize what this other momentary self is like, people are very bad at it. Um, there's a prepotent or strong tendency to focus on the me that is related to the kind of traits that we have. So what we find in regular people is that they find a little bit of reduction in these cortical midline structures in the, the north dorsal medial prefrontal cortex. Um, but really, they are stuck in this mode of self-reference that is the dominant mode, the me mode. In a separate group of people that we were randomized to take part in a two-month course in mindfulness meditation, mindfulness meditation is a focus on a non-judgmental awareness of the present. So these individuals were practicing the capacity to focus on the selves in the moment rather than this other type of self. In this group of people, they could reduce activity in this brain region, in these cortical midline structures, disengaging the me. And in addition, what we found is a unique set of structures that might represent the self in the moment, something that we have not been able to visualize before. There are multiple structures here that are activated. Two of them that uh, are important to, oops, I am acting very much like a rookie by not knowing how to advance this. Um, the structures on the lateral surface of the, of the, the lateral surface of the brain are related to attention and executive control like Nathan was suggesting, but there also was an additional structure, the, the posterior insole that's highlighted in green that was in particular activated during this momentary focus on the self. What's so important about this structure? It looks like it's a little blop or, uh, or blip in the brain that's not as big as the others. Turns out it's really critical to our theorizing about the nature of the self. This part of the brain, the insula, is an older cortex. 
So if you look at the outside of the brain, it's invisible. You have to pull away the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe, and hidden inside there is an archaeologically older cortex called an archaecortex. It's not like the neocortex, it has less layers. This part of the brain we now understand, and we've been working on, represents the internal state of your body. Rather than the mind, as you normally think of it, this is the status of the physiological condition of your body. If we look here, if you've ever, uh, on the lateral surface of the brain, there is something called the somatosensory map or somatosensory homunculus. It's a map of your body, the external parts of your body on your brain. If we follow this down around the face and into your mouth, it actually goes into the, anterior, into the insula, meaning it's actually, you have a map of your body, and then it continues into the innards of your body. And that's what the insula represents. It's something that's very poorly mapped in humans because it's very hard to stimulate the inside of the body. So we know a lot about the external body, but little about the internal, uh, this internal sense. So what we think this activation represents in uh, focusing on the moment is really a monitoring of your, your existence, your body in the moment. We've followed up looking at this by uh, trying to map out what exactly this brain region does. Uh, in this study, we've uh, focused on people attending to their breathing. The interoceptive, we call it interoception. Interoception is the ability to perceive things that are emanating from the inside of your body. It's a very different way of looking at the world. We're used to thinking about things in the external world, but there is also a sensory system in our brains that represents what we feel on the inside. And we've done a number of studies trying to do careful mapping of these brain regions um, to try to figure out what they, re what they represent. So what we found is that this part of the brain that represents the temporary self, the momentary self, in meditation ends up becoming uh, much more sensitive to interoceptive awareness. So with two, week, two months of meditation training, of focusing on the temporary self, of focusing on the moment with daily breathing exercises, what you find is that those who did their homework, those who practiced daily meditation of sitting and focusing on being in the moment, paying attention to their experience, resulted in greater recruitment of this representation of the inside of their body. And we think that's what's critical for their ability to access this distinct form of self-awareness. Now, that's the neurophilosophy part, talking about ideas of the self and how we can understand how the self is not a single thing, but multiple things with many representations in the brain. And one type of self that is really hard for us to get access to, this momentary self. Now what we wanted to do is understand how these different forms of self are related to the experience of emotions, both healthy emotions and unhealthy emotions. The way we do this is um, we, uh, we let people watch movies in the scanner. Um, for those of you, how many of you have seen Terms of Endearment? If you ask that of undergrads, they have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, uh, we show people clips of Terms of Endearment, uh, The Champ. Um, I remember seeing The Champ as a little kid and crying in the movie theater. What we're trying to do is induce real sadness over little four minute blocks of watching films. Um, when we do that, and we look at the brain activity that's associated with sadness, what's surprising to us is that we are recapitulating or restating that me network. Those cortical midline structures that were relevant to paying attention to who you are across time are engaged more when you are sad. What we find is that in addition to that network, there is a disengagement of the other I network the temporary self, the one that's associated with this interoceptive condition of the body. So one way to think of emotions is both as a mental thing that's related to me as a concept, but also me as, uh, as a corporal physical thing, the feelings that emanate from my body. What you find during sadness is strangely, although we might feel that it emanates from the body, it's really more conceptual uh, in many people. That there's a disengagement of the visceral sensations, the representations that represent the viscera. And this disengagement is really important for understanding the difference between healthy and unhealthy emotions. So those who show a greater disengagement of the representations of their feelings emanating from their body during sadness 
are more likely to be depressed presently. They're the ones who are having not just sadness, but dysphoria. Those who experience sadness with their bodies, and these tend to be those who uh, we've ex exposed to mindfulness meditation training, they start recovering these interoceptive signals, experience sadness not just through the me or through these midline structures, but through the, the bodily representation of their, uh, the inside of uh, their body, they are protected or have decreased depression. What we've done after that is to examine individuals who have a history of depression. They are formally depressed. These people have had up to four relapses in major depression. Major depression is a recurring disorder. It's very difficult to, ha to recover from major depression permanently. There are, are, there are periods of remission where you are well. In this study, we looked at people who were all well, meaning they were clinically recovered from, from their major depression, whether through treatment with cognitive behavioral therapy or, uh, or medication. These individuals all are clinically no longer depressed. What we're interested in is if we can look at the networks in their brain under sad mood to predict who was vulnerable to relapsing in the next year and a half to depression. Basically, looking at activity in the brain to say who is really in need of further help, who will fall back into depression versus who is going to maintain their remission and be healthy. The parts of the brain that were revealed that were important for predicting relapse over the next 18 months future depression were these same cortical midline structures that we've shown are important to representing the me across time, that narrative self that's, uh, and this representation of emotion apparently is not just sadness, but represents a dysphoria that's really destructive. It's an unhealthy form of sadness that even though all of the state of the art behavioral measures we have, looking at these people say that they are well, that we can use functional imaging to be able to activate, to, to explore in their brains the kind of self-referential or emotional processing that represents a vulnerability towards future relapse 18 months from now. And what we want to do next is to be able to see if we can save these people from relapse. Uh, the work that we plan to do is to see through different kinds of treatment like mindfulness meditation if we can normalize these neural markers of relapse and then hold off uh, the relapse into depression and maintaining well-being. Um, and I believe that is my, uh, that's, that's the end. Thank you very much. And we have some time for questions. Do you have, do you have a question already? Yeah. <laughs> have you thought about um, potentially using these techniques to determine whether um, exposure to violent video games, war games, et cetera, creates permanent changes in the brain? And if so, how much? Uh, I have um, The question is whether. Uh, I have personally thought, or maybe this is also a recommendation if I haven't, uh, to consider how these networks that we've discovered that are related to unhealthy emotions or a certain kind of self-processing that might be dangerous, unhealthy, is influenced by uh, watching violent video games. Um, no, I have not personally thought of this before, but I think uh, it's a really inter interesting extension. Um, what we're hoping to do, when we apply for grants, to get money to do neuroimaging. Uh, the granting agencies, for good reason, want us to prove that the neuroimaging adds something, right? So we can all be seduced into thinking brain images are really interesting because they're colorful, and it's the brain. Um, however, what we really need to do is show that the brain imaging is adding something that just other kinds of behavioral paper and pencil kinds of tests couldn't reveal. So any time when someone, um, I tried to be a little bit of a skeptic. Maybe my colleagues don't like me saying that. Um, what I want, we should use brain imaging. It should be tested against other concurrent measures to see that brain imaging is adding something to, say, the understanding of maybe 
how people might differ in terms of being susceptible to violence watching video games where others are not. And this is an important question for, I think, that we can think about is instead of thinking of all people as the same, is understanding how video game exposure, based on the kind of network activity that you have in one person can lead to violence and another person does not. Um, and so maybe that is not amenable to paper, paper and pencil tests now, but the hope is that if we find those differences with brain imaging, then maybe we don't have to do brain imaging always. We can develop tools to assess that with paper and pencil tests that you can do in the classroom. Um, I think if we're one more quick question. Uh, following up on that. There is one back. Let's, let's <laughs> it's all right. Go ahead. I'll. Uh, are depressed people uh, susceptible to uh, shift in imaging? associated with mindfulness training? So the, the question is, are people who have a history of major depression, are they amenable or susceptible to shifts in these networks related to mindfulness meditation sorry, training? Sorry, sorry, right, so that is, that's the next step. So the next step is to see, we have two parallel lines of research showing in, we call a subclinical community sample, the kind of people who say they want to take part in a mindfulness meditation course. Usually when you want to take in a mindfulness meditation course, like all of us, you have issues. Um, who, who doesn't have issues? I'm not sure who those people are. Um, if you say you don't, that's an issue. Uh, <laughs> We've, so some of the research that I've shown is related to the subclinical depression, and that last work is really related to genuine major depression. So what we're trying to do then is, the, the newest study is looking at, we've scanned 100 individuals with a history of depression. I mean, we need to do this kind of work, you need great access to a scanner, um, where we don't want to look at just 10 people as typical in a study, but to look at a wide variety of people to be able to understand other factors that might predispose someone to depression. And we're then using their activity to see if we should, like, if it predicts whether they will be depressed in the future, and then we can give them medication. Medication in this case is treatment with mindfulness meditation training. We put them back in the scanner to see if we can normalize their vulnerabilities if they disappear, and then that is, saves them from relapsing. So that's the work to be done. These are just some of the wonderful students in my laboratory who contributed to this particular presentation. It's only a subset of my entire group, but I just wanted to put them up first because I think of the students first. Um, and and in particular, you, as you probably, some of you know, I'm interested in why people take risks. So, so why would you, uh, would you take $1,000 for sure, or would you take a risk and uh, perhaps flip a coin, and if, it gets, if it's heads, you get $2,000, but if it's tails, you get nothing. Which of those options would you want, the sure option or the risky option? Uh, would you play Russian roulette for a million dollars? Would you, would you take a risk on your life? Would you have unprotected sex? And um, what would you drink before you were 21? These are all questions we've actually done research on. Now, you'll be happy to know the Russian roulette one was hypothetical. <laughs> no undergraduates were killed in the course of this research. <laughs> so in particular, I'd like to focus today not just in general on whether people you know, are risk takers or whether they like to take risks, but who likes to take risks. Are there individual differences? Do some people like to take risks more than others? Uh, is it a function of your experience in life? And I'm going to show you briefly some data from intelligence agents. Yes, real people who deal with national security. Those are, I would guess, professional risk takers, educated risk takers, um, but nevertheless people with training who have to deal with very dire situations that involve uncertainty and you know, very extreme consequences. Um, so I'm going to show you some data on how, whether they take risks or not, and how they take risks, and how their mental process is different. I don't have brain data on them yet, but I'm looking forward to it. Brain maturation, is that another thing that affects whether people take risks? Yes, of course, right? Um, that's something that we're, that we're uh, and I'm going to show you some brain data on that. And in particular, adolescence is this, this mysterious enigma of a time period in life in which all kinds of things uh, increase, including susceptibility to reward, 
crime and the tendency to engage in crime goes peaks in, in adolescence and young adulthood, and then it comes back down. And we have what's called adolescent limited crime. I'm going to talk to you and show you some activation in the brain that's related to antisocial behavior. Certain parts of the brain activate more for those people who are higher in sensation seeking and those people in adolescence and young adulthood who are the ones taking the risk. And that small group of, of adolescents is responsible disproportionately for the antisocial behavior and the crimes and so on. But it's a temporary state for most people. Then there are those people who continue throughout their life to be sensation seekers, and they tend to get into repeated trouble. And uh, we're, we studied their brains, too. So without further ado, uh, here's a concrete example. Don't worry if you don't, if you don't remember too many of the details. All you have to remember is there's, we're going to present to all the people I'm going to talk about a choice between a sure option and a risky option. So think of this about as, for example, you're going, you work for, the, for a federal agency that shall remain nameless. And you have, there's an embassy in trouble. And you have two possible plans. You can either save 200 people for sure. That's a risk avoiding plan. Or you can take a chance, and you have a one-third probability of saving all 600 people maybe in this compound, but a two-thirds probability that nobody will be saved. Most people pick the sure option. So that's risk avoiding for gains or positive outcomes. Now what about if you, if you had the same exact choice? So 600 people are in that compound, and they're at risk if nothing's done. You have a choice between 400 of them dying for sure, or some probability that 600 would die or none would die. Now, all of a sudden, it looks much better to take a risk. You can't have 400 people die for sure, not on your watch, right? So now you want to be a risk taker. Now, of course, you're seeing these back to back, and you know they're identical. So this is called a framing bias, and we're going to talk about this. This particular framing bias is due to sensitivity to context. You know, where did I start out and where did I end up? If I start out at zero and I save 200 people, I'm 200 ahead. If I start out at zero and I lose 400 lives, I'm 400 behind. And that psychology of that, that framing bias, changes with age and predicts a whole host of other behaviors. And we use it as kind of a, a metric to get inside people's head. So basically, if frame, the framing bias is risk avoiding for gains, risk seeking for loss. That's the standard bias. And it's irrational, technically, right? Because it's the same number of lives you save in the end. So you shouldn't have this bias, technically. But this bias actually increases with age. And it, it actually helps you avoid risk taking. If you're counting the number of lives and thinking about the probability and trading them off, that, in fact, is risk promoting because it's calculating the odds. And when the odds are with you, and for unprotected sex, for the risk of HIV and things like that, the, actual, the odds actually are with you. You're probably not going to contract HIV. So that's risk promoting if you think about the odds and the consequences. So there's different kinds of sources of risk taking. So here is our, my very busy slide, but, uh, but I will quickly walk you through it. Um, if you notice. Here, just think of the middle. This is the complete one. So imagine 200 saved for sure versus 1 3rd 600 saved, 2 thirds none. This is just the gain frame. People also got the loss frame. And as you can see, our intelligence agents here show a much bigger difference between risk taking for gains versus risk taking for loss, losses. That difference between these two is the framing bias. That's irrational. And these 36 intelligence agents actually show more of a bias than our college students or our similarly aged post-college adults. These other two conditions I'm not going to talk about too much, but basically th this one just simply has you focus on 200 people for sure versus one th third 600. It takes away the zero. That's the only thing we do. We, we manipulate your attention to different parts of that problem, and that makes the bias go away. So if this is a math problem and all you have to do is divide, everybody's very, very similar. right? So they're, good, they're equally good mathematicians, but once you introduce the possibility of none saved or the possibility of none died, then you start getting this, this bias. And if you focus people on these categorical differences, it's even bigger and even more so in our intelligence agents, which kind of gives you pause a little bit, right? They should maybe be uh, less biased. All right. So here's our new magnet. Uh, we only recently were approved to run human subjects, but we got started immediately after that. Um, and our very first uh, MRI grant has already been obtained from the NIH, and we've run our first studies. And this is a little shot. I hope you have a chance to take a tour, by the way, at some point uh, through the window at our machine. And here is an actual anatomical scan of a human brain taken with our machine here at Cornell. 
And uh, you know, mostly these images are pretty fuzzy when you see them. This one's remarkably clear. And that's partly because we have tremendously talented physicists who help us get these, these great pictures. So here is an actual college student, one person. This is one person's brain. And we looked at this contrast between when you show this bias, the one that the intelligence agents showed, that risk avoiding for gains, risk seeking for loss. And you, separate, you look at the activation in the brain when you're doing that versus when you're not doing that, when you're not biased. And as you can see, lots of different areas of the brain light up. This is only one person. You know, it's not statistically significant, but I wanted to show you an image of an individual brain thinking about this kind of risk taking problem. Now, there's lots of different areas that light up. I won't go over all those. But as you can see, it involves a lot of the brain, including our, our famous insula. Now, um, what about adolescents and, and, and adults? Remember, adolescents are these risk takers. How do, do they show? Are they biased or are they unbiased? Well, we get what's called a developmental reversal. Remember, our experts were more biased than our college students. So it's like the reverse of what you would normally think. The experts should be less biased and more rational. In fact, you see the same kind of, pr what we would pr uh, predict from our theory, developmental re reversal here with adolescents as well. So as you can see in your complete problem, your um, adolescents, in fact, are, have a smaller difference between risk taking for gains versus risk taking for losses uh, compared to the adults. The adults show more of a framing bias. Now the good news is we seem to be able to manipulate uh, even in adolescence, whether you show this bias, we can make it bigger by focusing on the categorical difference between some saved and none saved, uh, or some die and none die, or we can make the bias go away, although it's, it's a little reverse, actually, in adolescence. And this signature of the opposite bias pattern actually correlates with risk taking, too. I can go into the details if you want. But the bottom line here is that uh, adolescents are technically more rational than adults are. They show less of a bias. But we can make a difference in how we present their options to them. And we can, in fact, affect their tendency to take risks. All right. What about the brain? Well, here's some, uh, some images of the brain of uh, adults, actually, who are, are showing this bias versus when they're not showing the bias, when their choices are of that bias kind that we actually think is a more cognitively advanced way of thinking. It's biased, but it takes into account context and meaning. And that actually increases with age and development and expertise. Taking the context into account biases you, but in fact, it's really overall, in a global sense, more adaptive. So here's some parts of the brain. I'm not going to show you all the parts of the brain that, that activate. But here's the superior parietal cortex. This is a part of the brain that we, we haven't really talked about a whole lot. There's, the, there's a little bit of work on it in memory, a little bit of work on it in mathematical cognition and so on. But this is part of the brain that seems to light up specifically when you use certain strategies about risk. In particular, when you say, it's better to have something than nothing. You know, rather than worry about, oh, I might make a million dollars, well, you know, it's good to have 100,000. 100,000 for sure is pretty good, that kind of thing. So this particular area of the brain has been linked to those kinds of strategic uh, thinking. And that lights up when you show this particular bias, which we think is semantic. Now, what about what's happening in the brain across individuals? Well, if you look at the degree to which people show this bias, so all this is here is the degree to which you show that pattern I talked about, risk avoiding for gains, risk seeking for losses. That co-varies with the amount of activation in the superior parietal. So even across individuals, you see a strong relationship between activation in this part of the brain, this part that shows the strategy, and individual variation in, in decision making. What about, um, this is the right superior parietal, remarkably similar. <laughs> so uh, what about these individual differences I talked about in sensation seeking? This is the kind of thrill seeking stuff. People in prison score higher on this, you know? Where's the party? Um, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, joy writing, uh, crime is related to this. So I like doing things just for the thrill. And it doesn't mean that all sensation seekers end up in prison. I'm not saying that. If you can channel that, you know, maybe, maybe what you do is you join a SWAT team and you rescue hostages. You know? But it's those kind of adrenaline junkie type people. right? So what about individual differences in this and, 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 uh, and self-reported risk taking? Well, this just shows you that as your sensation seeking score goes up, as many people have found, your self-reported risk-taking goes up. And in particular, antisocial behavior, stealing, 
that kind of stuff goes up. So that's sort of telling you, yeah, it does correlate with these things I just said it correlated with. And what about, and I'm just going to selectively show you. Now, if remember we said that the no framing, when you don't show this bias, that's when you're a risk taker. That's kind of when you're getting into trouble, right? And this is what our theory predicts. And you know, the lot of turgid theory I won't trouble you with. But anyway, when, when you're, you, the no framing, when you're not picking according to this adult pattern, this expert pattern of semantic bias, uh, then um, your right insula is activated in an adult. And the insula, we've talked a little bit about the insula before, a, little, a different part of the insula here. But um, the insula actually is a very interesting thing. It's, there's actually some commonality in our two presentations. The insula is the part of your inside that reacts to things like cravings, um, to that feeling of uncertainty. Not the uncertainty per se, but the feeling you get when you go, uh-oh, you know, we might default on our loans in the federal government. Uh-oh, I feel anxious about that. I feel uncertain about that. That's risky. So that inner part of you kind of reacts. Uh, interoceptive or somatosensory uh, signals. And it's also related to loss and things like that. Not a whole lot of voxels here, but more here. Um, and if you look at now individual differences, so this is the degree to which people agree with things, like I do things just for the thrill of it, those things that maybe get teenagers in trouble. If you look across individuals, you see more and more activation in that insula as your sensation-seeking score goes up. So the, this is the actual activation in the brain that, is, that goes in lockstep with the degree to which you have the sensation-seeking trait. And I guess my time, time's about done. All right, so um, here is also the actual risk-taking questionnaire. So this is self-reported antisocial behavior. Again, the insula is activated as you're more and more agreeing, yes, I'm engaging in these antisocial activities. This part of your brain is activating more and more and more. This is the part of the brain, by the way, when they, when someone had, a, uh, they did a, they found out from a single case study someone uh, had a, had a, a damage to the brain in this, and they woke up and they had no more cravings for cigarettes. So, that's, which is kind of a, it was an accident, but it's a cool effect, and naturally people are following it up. So these cravings that can get you into trouble, that can tempt you to take risks. So that's a part of the brain. So, um, what about adolescence? The adults activate for that framing greater than no framing, that bias stuff. Adolescents act, don't show hardly any activation for that. They show the opposite activation, just as we would predict. And again, you can see the insula. This is a, a sample of teenagers that we looked at. Um, and the anterior cingulate, which uh, is an area that's been associated with conflict and internal, sort of an internal war you might have with yourself, um, in this case, between strategies. So in sum, uh, the, our, our particular theory actually predicts this developmental reversal. It's kind of a paradox. I love paradoxes, where in fact the experts and the, and the, the um, adults compared to the adolescents are more biased, not less. And that's because they're semantic processors who process context. Uh, we show that adults show brain activation for more bias over less, in the, in, in, but adolescents show the opposite. They show much more activation when they're unbiased, and that's where that kind of thinking is associated with risk-taking and sensation-seeking. And I think I'll close there and also thank the good people who helped. And there's that. <laughs> so uh, risk-taking does have common denominators across different kinds of risk-taking activities. Brain changes are just beginning to be understood. We're really at the, you know, at the ground floor of these exciting new developments. It's amazing. We can reach inside the brain with this instrument and see how people's personality relate to activation in the brain. So we're very excited about it. And thank you to everyone who made it possible. We have a few minutes for, for questions. Yes? That's a good, well, I guess I should corroborate with my colleague here and look at that. Um, manic, uh, the, in the manic state, people emulate a kind of sensation seeking. They engage in the kinds of activities that people engage in who are high sensation seekers. You know, they borrow money and marry people spontaneously and do things like that. So there may be some connection there, but that's not a, uh, a topic that I'm, a, I'm an expert on. Yes? Can you measure the biochemical or molecular activities that represent these? Yeah, there are, 
there are, um, there's work on the, what's called the dopaminergic system, which is that reward kind of system in the brain that's connected to areas of the brain that, that have to do with reward um, in the limbic system. And so there's some work on that that says that some of these neurotransmitters are involved in this. But the neurotransmitter story, although we have some of our colleagues are working on that, um, is not quite as clear as the functional activation story. But people are working on that. All right. Oh, we have another one. OK. But this can be sexual risk taking. Yeah, she asked about sexual risk taking. And in fact, uh, that's something we've done research on. And that, that little hypothetical task that you saw, the framing task, for example, that actually predicts sexual risk taking in adolescents because it, it, it essentially diagnoses a kind of thought process in your mind. And it's related to how early you initiate sex, how many different sexual partners you have as an adolescent, and so on. So there's something about the way we think. It isn't just that we're attracted to rewards more in adolescence, although we are. Um, but it's also about the nature of the way we think. And in adult behavior, there are these group of people that continue to take risks. And they seem to think in a similar way to adolescents and have similar reward sensitivity. Exactly. Well, thank you all so much for coming, and more soon. <laughs>